This is Astronomy with Josh, and we're talking about planetary observation tonight. Keep it locked. Mom's library. Sure, the lighting is terrible for a video, but look, I finished the room. I built this bookcase. I painted the ceiling. I fixed the ceiling. That was a pain in the neck. Literally. Painted the walls. Accidentally painted them purple. More on that later. Did the floor, made the crown molding, put fancy trim on this bookcase, even got my fossils on display right here. On a knee. So, observing the planets, finding Marvin the Martian, and watching Saturn do a cosmic hula hoop. Who doesn't want to do that, right? Great thing is, is to see the planets, you don't need any telescope, just go out and look. Right now, we can see Jupiter, Saturn, Mars, and Uranus. <laughs> uh, excuse me, I'm looking for, um, what are you looking for, sir? I was volunteering one time down at the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum, and some kid asked me about, about the seventh planet, and he smirked. And I had to be professional, and I couldn't even make a joke about it. Oh, well. So, lots of stuff to see in the sky, and if you're using a telescope, I wanted to talk to you about eyepieces, because I'm a nerd. My brothers would say, excuse me, I'm looking for a nerd. So, okay, here's what a telescope does, beside look nerdy is it gathers light and then it magnifies it. And you can tell how much it magnifies it, but what kind of eyepiece you're using. A little math, don't worry, it's not too hard. The focal length of the telescope, how long it takes the light to focus, divided by the focal length of the eyepiece. So let's make it easy. Let's say you have a thousand millimeter focal length telescope and you divide it by 10 millimeters in the eyepiece. That means a hundred times magnification. Then if you have a 20 millimeter eyepiece, that's a 50 times magnification. Generally speaking, the more you magnify, the more it zooms in, right? Depends on the eyepiece also has a field of view. This is a 12 millimeter. This is a 12 millimeter. This has an 82 degree field of view. This only has a 40 degree field of view. So more on that later. So you're going to zoom in on things. So you would think, well, if I'm going to try to find Marvin the Martian, I'm going to zoom in as much as I can, right? Wrong. It depends on how steady the atmosphere is. You know, like picture looking, looking at a pool, be like, well, no piranhas in there, right? But the bottom is wiggling around, or it appears to wiggle around. The, the water's distorting everything, right? Same thing happens when we're looking through the atmosphere. The atmosphere will move the light around. The atmosphere is really jiggly. You're going to have to use lower power. So you want to use as high power as you can. But if you're looking at something with, say, a 4 millimeter eyepiece on a night of bad scene, it's just going to be a blur, literally. So you want a whole range of eyepieces. It might be like, Josh, that sounds expensive. It can be, but I like to buy my eyepieces used. Cloudynights.com has a great classified section on there. And you can pick up some of my favorite planetary eyepieces, orthoscopics or orthos, for about 30 bucks. Worth checking out. What we got here besides different focal lengths of eyepieces, this is a 12, this is a 4, this is a 9 right here. We got different eyepiece designs. So this is a 12 and this is a 12. Might be like, well... They look pretty different, absolutely. This is something called an orthoscopic or ortho. This is something called a nagler. This is a big wide field eyepiece, which you can certainly use for planets, but I actually like these guys better for planets. They have less glass that the light has to pass through. So in theory, you get a slightly more pristine image. They're cheaper, great to check out. Again, narrow field of view. So if I'm looking at a big star cluster, this is gonna be awesome. But if I'm just looking at a tiny little planet, I'm gonna to wanna to use an ortho. And then I have a whole range of them. So I got a 12 and a half, I got the four, I got the nine, and this cool little thing called a Barlow lens. This particular one doubles anything that I put into it. This is 100 times, now it's 200 times. If this is 150 times, now this is 300 times. Generally speaking, you're gonna need less magnification than you would think because you're working against the turbulence in the atmosphere. We're going to be expecting a bit of turbulence. Uh, put those four millimeter eyepieces away and enjoy the rest of your flight. Really the best eyepiece too is the one that you have. So get out there and observe. Now the next thing is, is well, how, right? Well, first it seems pretty obvious. You point the telescope at your target and you look, right? Planets, you want a couple of things. If you're using a reflector, you want to make sure it's properly collimated. You want to, planets are tricky and you want to make sure everything is right. So you wanna make sure all your optics are lined up. You wanna make sure the telescope is the same temperature as the outside air. So if you keep your house nice and toasty and you go out on a cold autumn evening and you plunk your big mirror out there, it's gonna take a minute to cool down, right? Give it time. If it has a little fan on it, you can use the fan. Refractors tend to cool down a lot sooner, so people often prefer them. However, I find the bigger the telescope, the better. So my 12 and a half inch scope always outperforms my four inch refractor. 
there's all sorts of debates about that, but more on that on another video. So then, once your scope is aligned, once your scope is cooled, you got you try out a variety of eyepieces and you find the most magnification that the sky can support. So you might try your 12, that's working good. You try your four, whoop, it looks like a blurry mess. Your nine's working good. So you got your nine. And this nine is easy to load. Shout out to LL Cool J. You got it there. Now you're looking. Now what are you looking for? Well, it depends on the planet. And one of the things is it depends second to second because the atmosphere is moving, right? So sometimes it'll be calm and it'll move again. It'll be calm and it'll move again. You get the idea. I've had some coffee. Huh? Oh. To Mars! So you want to look at it. You want to give it time. You want to be patient. You can draw things. That helps people see. You can notice those fine little details and you're just looking for teeny little things. On Mars, you're looking for dark surface markings. That's actually where the wind on Mars blew the dust away, leaving rock underneath. How cool is that, right? And there's all sorts of planetary maps online so you can figure out what exactly it is you're looking at. On Jupiter, you're gonna be looking at the moons around it. You're gonna be trying to see the great red spot. You're gonna be trying to see its cloud belts. And occasionally a moon will go in front of the, well, quite regularly, the moon will go in front of the planet and you can catch a shadow transit where you've seen the shadow of the moon on Jupiter itself. It's the coolest thing. Saturn, you can see its rings. So you're gonna see some cloud banding on the globe of Saturn itself. And you're gonna see what's called the Cassini division. Italian astronomer, uh, what was his name? Well, obviously Cassini. We're just gonna say Mario Cassini, although it wasn't discovered this gap in the rings so you can see that on a steady night. basically get out there with whatever optics you have point it up at the sky and start looking you can't lose if you have any questions let me know planets you want to remember be patient do everything right line everything up if you don't have an ortho in your collection you might really enjoy it again 30 bucks on cloudynights.com check the classifieds practice practice like anything else it's not just the gear man it's this gear too Clear skies, and we'll see you next time.